Well, WrestleMania Night 2 certainly would seem like it has a tough act to follow. Because Night 1 certainly felt like it delivered in a lot of key ways. There were a couple of eh and duds in the night. But some of those big matches you were looking to really deliver really, really did. So let's dive in and talk about WrestleMania 39 Night 1. Starting off with the United States Championship, John Cena versus Austin Theory. They just couldn't help themselves. They had to put in one more Puff Pro Cena Make-A-Wish propaganda piece, didn't they? They just couldn't help it. You could tell as this match was going on, at one point you kind of got a nostalgic, let's go Cena, Cena sucks chance. And the, the crowd felt better about themselves. I was a little intrigued by the fact that you pulled out a ref bump on the first match of the card. I'm going to tell you, this felt like this actually should have went a few more minutes. Uh, and frankly, it was a match where you could look and say the times really changed. For it to only take that little bit for Austin Theory to beat John Cena. It was kind of underwhelming to me, I'm not going to lie. I can't be the only one. As it felt like just as this match was finding a rhythm, as just as this match was starting to get good, it's a nut shot, it's one A-Town or whatever the hell Theory stupid finisher is called, and then the match is over. Yeah, a little bit underwhelming, for sure. Uh, the WrestleMania Showcase Fatal 4-Way Tag Team Match was a pleasant surprise. You know, it wasn't a match I cared about going into it, but there certainly was the potential that it was going to be able to deliver in real time, and it did. Chad Gable's rolling German suplex, suplex on Braun Strowman was fantastic. Otis's taint sweat was rivaling Triple H levels in jeans. Like, that was amazing. You had a number of crowd-pleasing spots in this match, but they weren't too overdone. It wasn't just a match filled with them. It's just when you got there, you did it. And they looked really cool. Like freaking Ricochet shooting star press off the top rope and down onto the ground. Like that shit looked great. Gables rolling German suplex spot on Braun. This match was a pleasant surprise. Like this was good. So frankly, I thought the second match was better than the first one in the card. And then we got to one of the matches on night one that I was really, really, really looking forward to. And man, did it live up to my expectations. And then some Seth freaking Rollins versus Logan Paul. Logan Paul coming out with the HBK style zipline entrance was fantastic. And for some freaking reason, Seth Rollins wearing the straps when he was walking out of the ring, inspired by the fan gear, the Memphis big car piece of crap. But anyways, you know, I tweeted during the show that Logan Paul has athleticism and timing and a feel for storytelling and an it factor that 99% of wrestlers today just don't have. Like, he is believable. He is really good at this shit. He embraces being hated. Most wrestlers now can't stand it because they are insecure as fuck and they need a crowd to give him validation. He instead gets his validation from getting the right reaction from him, which is hate his damn guts. That box jump frickin' moonsault combo he did was impressive as hell. Even though for some reason for a moment I thought it was our truth like KSI in the prime bottle and doing that spot where Logan Paul jumps on him and through the announce table. Fantastic. Again, timing. Storytelling. This match kicked all types of ass. Personally, I would have liked to have actually seen Logan Paul in this match. And maybe you run it back in Puerto Rico, but... I can't really complain about this one. It This fucking match fucked, period. Not so much that six women tag team match, though. Ooh. I'm not really sure. I was confused about why they did the kind of black and white film noir look for Trish and Lita and Becky's entrance. I guess, whatever. Uh, but Trish Stratus, god damn! Some of you are going to say, I thought you didn't do white girls. Oh, there are always exceptions to the rules, folks. Like, still to this day. And taking a Thez press from Trish Stratus would be a hell of a way to go out. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Lita looked kind of old and clunky. Not trying to shit on her here. Just 
Like, it's kind of true, right? It stood out in this match. And frankly, this one went about five or seven minutes too long. Like, you kind of got a, the crowd with the finish, but it was kind of flat. It went too long. Like, this match felt like it got 15 damn minutes, and you probably could have gotten by with seven to eight. Like, just because you can go longer with a match doesn't mean you always should. You, know, you had other matches that were going to require more time on this night. You didn't have to go as long there. Because it felt like that freaking six-woman tag match got as much time as Dominic Mysterio and Rey Mysterio did. I'm just saying. But, speaking of that, Dominic and Rey. Fantastic. The video package leading up to this... Outside of apparently on the pre-show, they showed a picture of Dominic's stay in prison and it was an image of Auschwitz. <laughs> we caught that, WWE. Uh, but the entrance with Dominic coming in in the frickin' paddy wagon was great. And then, of course, Ray and Snoop coming out in the lowrider. And when Eddie's music hit, Viva La Raza, that place fucking exploded. And it was kind of bittersweet in a way, too, because, yeah, it's great to hear that theme again and hear a wrestling crowd pop huge for it. But I really miss Eddie Guerrero. And a story like this, man, it would have been great for him to be around. Could you imagine what an Eddie Guerrero in his presence could have meant to a story like this? Could you imagine? Especially if he's talking about that he was Dominic's dad, which we all know he is. We all know he is. Um... But this match fucked, too. The LWO run-in was cool, you know, to ward off Judgment Day. Bad Bunny getting up from the commentary table was great to take the chain away. Earlier on, you had the interaction with Dominic and his mom and his sister. Like, the storytelling here was top-notch. It was an awesome match. And contrary to what probably a number of people were thinking or expecting going into this, the right person won. You couldn't let Dominic do all this crap on the weekend that Ray is joining the WWE Hall of Fame and have him go over Ray. You don't have to stop this story here. You could set up the tag match in freaking Puerto Rico. You got options there. You could do Dominic and Damian Priest versus Ray and Bad Bunny. How about that, right? God, this match was great. This is one of those storylines that was really, really well done, and it had a slow burn over a long period of time to get to this payoff. It was fantastic. Now, I know the next match, I'm going to be in the minority here. Again, I'm used to it. But I thought Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair for the SmackDown Women's Championship was fucking stupid. This should have been a goddamn quick squash, put over Rhea, really put her over. Really put her over. I mean, as I tweeted during the show, like Dominic not getting along with his family. You know, women make men do that all the time. When you look at Rhea Ripley, you can kind of understand why if you're a dude. Am I right? You know I am. I even see people tweeting about Dr. Umar and telling them, sorry, y'all go ahead have to miss me on that one. <laughs> I understand where you're coming from, dude. This shit needed to be a quick squash for everybody fucking involved. You should have put Rhea over as a big monster. The less you put Charlotte out there to get her ass exposed for how bodgy of a bitch she is, the better. We don't need Karen Flair or Wrestling Karen or whatever the fuck you want to call her. Could go in 20 fucking damn minutes plus. And that's what we got here. Instead we got this long, drawn out ass match. And the crowd for three quarters of it didn't give a shit. Just because you started to finally get him in the last five minutes because you titillated the taint enough to say, hey, this match finally might fucking end. That doesn't mean the whole match was great. Charlotte had the frickin' botch where she landed on her frickin' head first. God, fuck. How could she be in these big spots and never execute right? Yes, Rhea won. The finish, the last couple of minutes of this was good, I will grant you. But people talking about this being one of the best women's matches of all time are fucking insane in my opinion. Just saying. Now, when I saw Miz and Snoop there, you know, they kicked off the show. Now they're back and you're kind of like, oh, this is the traditional. You're going to announce the attendance to give yourself a pat on the back. But maybe they'll do something else here. 
Pat McAfee comes back and he's going to challenge Miz? Like, you've got Bobby Lashley, you've got LA Knight, and Pat McAfee's the one you bring back? Yeah, cool to see Pat McAfee, but I'm just saying. Yeah, I know you still got tomorrow night too, but you couldn't put Bobby Lashley or LA Knight in that spot? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Also, if you were going to do this impromptu match, couldn't you have cut a couple of minutes from the women's tag? Couldn't you have cut maybe five to seven minutes for freaking Rhea and Charlotte? It actually would have helped that match more. Am I right? You know I am. But we get to the main event. And thank God the WWE came to their senses and went with the logical choice here. Because there was only one match that was fitting of main eventing night one. And that was for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. It's Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn versus the Usos. You know, I saw people tweeting about the fact that this is the second straight year that Kevin Owens has main evented night one of WrestleMania. That's a pretty honorable distinction. I think about this is that this is such a long story between these two, you know, friends for many, many years. They're from fi main eventing Final Battle 2010 when they were Kevin Steen and Al Generico to now here... WrestleMania 39 in 2023, their main eventing night one. The storytelling here was fantastic. They didn't have to get too cute. Like, this shit fucked. And when Sammy gets the pinfall victory, that place erupted as it should have. This is why this match had to main event. Because nothing else is going to be able to follow it. And the WWE deserves credit for coming to their damn senses and getting this one right. So while this wasn't a perfect night, you could have cut some of the fat here and given us an action jam-packed three hours and it would have been fantastic. You could have fixed some of the fucking timing for some of the stupid ads on Peacock that were showing during the damn event. The timing there was awkward on some of this shit. Here's a long video package about Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. And now let's go talk about fucking TurboTax or some shit like that. A couple of these matches could have been shorter. You could have done without the Pat McAfee appearance for that purpose. But man, this was a fun night one. And it's going to be a tough road to hoe for all those that are appearing on night two to top this shit. You almost wonder if WWE popped their nut a little too early here. Let's hope not, but this was a really good start to WrestleMania weekend, that's for goddamn sure.